Hello and good morning, Faith Church. Good to see you on this beautiful Thursday morning at 10 a.m. I can see that we've got our usual suspects already gathered to join in for Bible study today. Welcome to each and every one of you. Well, we're going to start off with a song. This is by Marty Hagen. It's called All Are Welcome. And I've played this a couple times, but it's probably relatively new for you. But a wonderful message. Everybody's welcome in the church. Everybody's welcome in the family of God. So let's listen to these words. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall in divisions. join together in prayer this morning. God, we're thankful that you welcome us with open arms. You call us to gather in to be in your presence and to share in your presence with one another. We're grateful that we have a chance to gather today uh, through this unique means online, yet gathered together by your Spirit. And we are grateful that we have a chance to open your word today. We ask that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and minds. You would guide our study. You would speak to us as we read your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good to see everybody here. And let's just check in with everyone. Good morning to Karen and Mike to Judy and to Diane, to Chrissy, Bob and Carol, Wilma and uh, Paula, Pandora, Debbie and Jim. Good to see everybody here today. And we are going to continue the study from the last few weeks. We've been looking over the book of Genesis and we finished uh, chapter three last time. And I'd like to just pick up on one of the thoughts that we kind of ended with, and then we'll go on into chapters four and beyond. Uh, let's uh, we'll see how long it it uh, we'll see how long we can go. So um, let's look at uh, 
this uh, ending text here, verse 22 from uh, Genesis chapter 3. It says, uh, God said, man has become like one of us, capable of knowing everything ranging from good to evil. What if he now shall reach out and take the fruit of the tree of life and eat it and live forever? Never, this cannot happen. Now, this is... Um, uh, this is what God is saying after Adam and Eve have been tempted and they have already eaten of the fruit and uh, you know they've they've uh, they were ashamed they tried to cover themselves and uh, God asked them what they had done they kind of started blaming one another the man blamed the woman the woman blamed the serpent and and so on so uh, we see that there were consequences or curses that came out of that. And uh, so this is what God says. He says, man has become like one of us. Now it's interesting, and this is the, the one thing that I wanted to dwell on just for a minute. This is actually what the serpent said would happen. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it says, The serpent told the woman, You won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything ranging all the way from good to evil. So this is what, uh, what the serpent said. So in, apparently this part of what the serpent said was not something that was false because God turns around and says now they're like us knowing everything ranging from good to evil if we look uh, at the original text it, it says you'll be like God or it could be you'll be like gods and of course we're, we're still kind of scratching our head about why God is always using this kind of um, it's, it's a, a third person plural to refer to himself, or it's, I guess it's a second, second person plural. God's talking about us when he refers to himself. So um, this seems to be something that, uh, th this is where we go back to the story of the temptation, this part of the story of the temptation, and we ask ourselves, what is the serpent doing there? What is the purpose of the serpent being there? What's the serpent's motivation? You know, we're, if, if we're going to ask ourselves, just looking at this as a, as a, a, a story with characters, um, what's, why does this happen? Why does this temptation happen? This is, this is right at the heart of this big question that comes back over and over again when we're in Bible studies, and that is, why, why is God allowing these things to to happen? Why is God allowing these these bad things to happen? So, does the story doesn't tell us where the serpent comes from? Uh, it's, it does say the serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. Um, it, 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 there's no big backstory to the serpent. Now, you may have read um, or have heard people talk about the backstory of the serpent, and that comes from using some other texts throughout the scriptures, some from Isaiah, some from the book of Revelation, books that are written at a different time period under uh, different settings and describes the accuser or Satan in a certain way. You have, um, you have stories about the, uh, about the, uh, the star, the kind of the, the star falling from heaven this is, uh, this is like one of the original angels and, and kind of the backstory that we have in Christianity is, is Satan is one of the original, if not the first angel. He's there with all the other angels in heaven before earth and everything else is created. 
and he has his own falling out with God, just like Adam and Eve do. But um, but this one is, um, you know, there's 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 a lot less detail in the scripture about about why that happened. Now, this whole question of why does God allow things bad things to happen, you know, you can keep going back and you can say, well, this happened to Adam and Eve Eve because the serpent came in and screwed things up. If he hadn't been there to tempt them, maybe they wouldn't have been tempted. We go back to, well, then who tempted the serpent or who tempted Satan? It's not, it's not clear who, who this serpent is. In Christian tradition, we attribute this serpent to Satan himself, to the angel Lucifer who fights with God in heaven, who collects like a third of the angels in rebellion against him. They're thrown down to earth. And, uh, and then the whole book of Revelation is about how throughout the course of human history and God's plan unfolding, finally the devil is defeated, the evil is defeated. And so <clears throat> often in our tr- own traditions, we've gone back and said, well, this serpent is Satan. Um, if we're just looking at the story here, it, it, we are not getting that picture from Genesis 3. There's, there's not this big backstory about this malevolent, malevolent force or this satanic character that's coming and becoming the serpent. Um, whether or not they are the same, I don't, I don't know how much that um, really matters in the story he said something to Eve, and within her own free will, within her own thoughts and ideas, with the information she was given, she decided to go ahead and do what God had asked her not to do. Apparently, she was, she <clears throat> was tempted by, it says that uh, when the woman saw the tree looked good for eating, so it looks like you know, it's, it looks like yummy fruit. When she saw that it was good for eating and she realized what she would get out of it, she would know everything. Then she took and she ate it. So the temptation was, I want to know more. I want to understand the range of, of reality. I want to understand more about life. That was the temptation. And <clears throat> that is what God said at the end here that she accomplished or that she received. She did get this certain insight into life ranging from good to evil. Now there's there's a lot of different there's a lot of different theories and takes on what this means. What does it mean to know good and evil or to know everything ranging all the way from good to evil? Um, I have heard people try to say that that this is <clears throat> the first time that we see some kind of dualism. So before in the garden, as they're as they're kind of like naked and unashamed, they're in this they're in almost like this beginning of life phase, like we are when we're babies. There's when when we're babies and we don't understand things like we do when we're adults, everything is just kind of mixed together more. And, you know, maybe there's not really in those first few years of being, maybe there's really not such thing as, as good and evil, except maybe um, I'm hungry. <laughs> that's, that's bad. Hungry, hungry is bad, and I'm going to complain about it. And if I complain about it, I find out that my hunger goes away because I get fed. So is that really good and evil or is that just kind of a natural part of life where it's our discomfort in, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> it's our discomfort in, in being hungry that makes us do whatever it takes to get food. Um, you know, of course there is things like pain if a baby is in pain from stomach ache or, 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 or something else. That's another thing is, is that, that cry out in pain 
And then hopefully that will bring me some kind of comfort eventually because somebody's going to take, take care of me. But to break it into what is good and evil, maybe that's just the, kind of the beginnings of what they understand. Later on, things get, you know, more complex. And so she, she eats of this fruit and she realizes something or she sees life in a way different than she had seen it before. Now, some, uh, some other uh, have described this, um, this story as being a story about growth. And it's a story about in, in kind of the, the, quote, infant stages or the, or the early stages of life. For any person, you have everything that you need. You have your, 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 your wants, your needs. Everything that you need, you've got right there. And it's a, it's a peaceful place. It's a good place. And then as you go on, life becomes challenging, difficult, complex. And so this is simply a story not so much about everything was perfect and then things went to crap, that we'll, which we'll see a couple chapters later in, in the story of Noah. This is, is, could be also about this, this gradual growth. They didn't understand a full range of good and evil and when they did then they realized the complexity of life and this is when God says in it it comes in and says look now that you know more now that you've grown up this is something that you will be experiencing in life this is what's coming down the pike you can kind of see this as as uh, if you're raising children and and you're teaching them about life at some point along the line, you ha- you give them more information about the complexities uh, and the challenges of life. And, and hopefully you also are giving them information about how things are very good uh, in, in life as well. So it can, it can be a story about the origins of sin. Classically, traditionally in, in Christianity, that's, this has been one of the stories that we go to to look at the origin of sin. But it can also be about the beginnings of humanity and this process of growth. And knowing more good and evil means life is more complex. And we understand consequences uh, in life more when our eyes are open. Now, the, uh, another little tidbit that's kind of interesting is this part where God says, What if they now should reach out and take the fruit of the tree of life and eat and live forever? This cannot happen. So this is when God closes the doors and says you can't come back into the Garden of Eden because if you if you did, you would live forever and that cannot happen. Um, I, I was reading this, you know, along with you, and I thought to myself, God never told them not to eat of the tree of life at the beginning and it seems like apparently they didn't eat of the tree of life Um, there's nothing in there about why they didn't Uh, it's just that tree of life doesn't show up until after (laughs) they've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil Um, so that's another scratch your head kind of a of a thing. Why did they not eat of the tree of life? It wasn't off limits until they eat of the knowledge of good, of good and evil, and now it's off limits. So, um, fortunately, I guess we can say we, we see in the story of the Bible, God gives us the, the alternate route to living forever in His presence. And so, uh, it's not by going backwards into the Garden of Eden, but it's by moving forward through this journey of salvation to to the tree of life. So maybe it's one of those things like once you've once you've grown up, you just can't go back. You can, whether you, some people might try really, really hard. But once you've grown and once you know a, a certain amount about life, you just can't go back. You can't go back to Eden. 
You can't go back to paradise. You can't go back to your ignorant as ignorance as bliss. Uh, and you can't live forever. I mean, when you're growing up and you're young, you think you're going to live forever. So um, God saying they can't eat of the tree and live forever. Uh, you know, this is this is part of the realization of growing up is that as you know more and life gets more complex, you realize I can't go back. I'm not going to live forever. Um, so that's we can look at this story as a story of growth, also as the as the origins of, of sin. I will I will mention this, and I've mentioned this a, a few other times in our Bible studies. Um, within the Protestant and Reformed traditions that we come out of as a congregational church and and mainline churches, uh, this is the, the idea of original sin is pretty. Uh, strongly rooted as a, a theological interpretation of what happens here in the garden. And, and what that means is, is that once our original parents, Adam and Eve, once they disobey, then everyone after them suffers the consequences of sin and you're born into sin. You're, you're born with sin as a part of your nature. And some Protestant groups more than others talk about the gravity of that. So some, some that are more like, like uh, Presbyterian brothers and sisters are, are those that kind of come from this Calvinist perspective. There's this term called total depravity. And what that means is you, you come into life and you're just going to always be, it's almost like gravity is pulling you toward evil, toward, toward doing the wrong thing. And that is the core of, the, of human nature and the human experience is that you come into life and sin is like gravity pulling you so, uh, so strongly. You just can't avoid it. You're always going to be fighting against it and you're always going to lean toward that. That's going to be your natural tendency is to sin. So that's, that's one interpretation. And usually with that interpretation is this uh, strong reliance on the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life. So if you just surrender yourself to the grace of God and power of the Holy Spirit, then, then you have a solution to that. You don't have to work your way out of it. God will, God will lift you up out of sin and give you grace in those circumstances. Now, on, on the other part of the spectrum of, of Christian theology... It's not so much in the Western Christianities as the Eastern or Orthodox Christianities. You have this idea that even though we see the story of sin originate here in Genesis chapter 3, it, it, um, it doesn't mean that, that from that point on we have this natural tendency toward doing wrong. We see more the Eastern Orthodox or, or Eastern Christianities would say, we see more in the story about the goodness of life. God says it was good over and over and over and over and over again, and then they make one big mistake. The thing that's more important to emphasize in understanding who we are as people is God creating things good. So there's this natural tendency for humans to do good, to want to do the right thing, to search for love and, and peace and, and, and to do good. So you've got these two very different perspectives within the Christian traditions on what comes out of this story in terms of what we should believe is the, the nature of, of sin. So one says, we tend to be horrible people. The other says we tend to be very good people. Now, this is probably one of those things that we still might wonder. We, we, it's, we, if we're looking, it's kind of like, are you, are you looking for the, the goodness that naturally arises in yourself and in people around you? If you're looking for that, you're probably going to see that. And you're going to see that in people time and time again. There's more good stuff and positive things that happens in life than there is negative. It's that whole glass empty, glass, uh, you know, half empty, half full. Um, there are very complex 
Christian traditions uh, that, uh, that go both ways, half empty, half full, and that plays a lot into the way that people view themselves and their lives and the church and who God is. And it's really up to us to kind of come to the conclusions ourselves. It are, even though humans have messed up historically, even though I know I've messed up historically, even though is there still this natural goodness to life that I should engage in? Now, I think, I think the, the ones that tend to say we're naturally sinful people probably are, are looking more toward the life after this one for the good to show up. And, and there can be different reasons for why someone would embrace that kind of an idea. Likely it's been in their experience, they've experienced the dark part of life. And, um, and, and, and it's real. <laughs> um, those who have experienced the good uh, in this life, I would imagine would tend to engage in this life a little bit more because there's more to enjoy and more to get out of it. So you might ask yourselves where you are on this spectrum of feeling like there's a natural tendency in us as human beings toward goodness or, or not. And you can find your Christian tradition to back you up uh, no matter what it is. So the story of the, of the fall or the story of the eating of the fruit this is a story we come back to over and over again with different lenses and different, uh, different takes on the story. I'd, I'd like to suggest that we look uh, at the process of the story of growth through this and we still see that the thing is God doesn't leave them alone and God, um, you know, they don't even have a conversation about, hey God, I'm sorry, and God is like, oh, I forgive you. It's just, it's just kind of, the story doesn't have that, that part in there. Um, it's just saying, you've done this. This is what will happen now. And, um, and, and, and here we are. We're living in the reality that Adam and Eve found themselves in. All right, let's go ahead and start with uh, four. So we're, we're outside of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are starting their new life. And uh, Genesis 4, we're looking at verse 1. I'm reading, if you remember, from the Message Devotional Bible, and uh, written by Eugene Peterson, also with a couple footnotes that we will look at. So Genesis 4, chapter 1. Adam slept with Eve, his wife. She conceived and had Cain. She said, I've gotten a man with God's help. So this probably, you know, this has to do with him being named. I'm going to go ahead and read Eugene Peterson's note here um, that's in chapter 4. This next part of the story involves Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. Sin, which in the parents had been vertically oriented, that is, it had upset the close relationship between humankind and God, in the sons became horizontally oriented, setting, upsetting the relationship between brothers. Sin, which had begun with what looked like a fairly innocuous eating of a piece of fruit, in a short time expressed itself in murder. If we treat God with contempt, it won't be long before we'll be treating our brother and sister with contempt as well. So I think that is a, a, good, and, a good and accurate statement. Uh, regarding the, the nature of sin. So Adam and Eve's was more about their relationship with God. Cain's and, Cain and Abel's is more about relationships between people. Verse 2 in Genesis 4. Then she had another baby, Abel. Abel was a herdsman and Cain a farmer. Time passed. Cain brought an offering to God from the produce of his farm. Abel also brought an offering, but from the firstborn animals of his herd choice cuts of meat. God liked Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering didn't get his approval. Cain lost his temper and went into a sulk. God spoke to Cain, why this tantrum? Why the sulking? 
if you do well, you won't be, if you do well, won't you be accepted? If you don't do well, sin is lying in wait for you, ready to pounce. It's out to get you. You've got to master it. Cain had words with his brother. They were out in the field. Cain came at Abel, his brother, and killed him. So that, that ends verse 8. So two brothers, one a herdsman, one a farmer. God prefers one offering over the other. And even in this text and, uh, and some others, uh, we see that this can even be a preference for the person themselves. Um, yeah, if we, look, if we look at the New Revised Standard Version, it says, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So here's where, here's where we see God playing favorites. And God playing favorites is a part of a lot of the Old Testament stories, the, the, the stories of the, of the Hebrew Scriptures. God choosing one over the other. This is not the, it, it is the first time it happens. It's not the last time that it's going to happen. We see it later on with uh, Isaac and Ishmael, with Jacob and Esau, with Joseph and his brothers. There's, there's always this idea of preference of choosing, and this is, likely, this is likely rooted in the deep Jewish theology that they are the chosen people. So this idea of being chosen, of God saying, I have a preference for you and what, how you are going to help me accomplish what is needed in this life. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, even though some later on uses the word hate, mostly this is just saying God had a preference. And so the question is, if God does have a preference, do we trust in God that God must be up to something and I can, and I can be okay with that? Or does this mean that I become jealous? And obviously Cain chose to, to become jealous, um, they were both being themselves and giving of themselves to God, and God just had a preference for one over the other. So what God tells Cain is he, he, he basically tells him this, this tough talk that we get as we're growing up, you need to take the high road. So even though something happens that hurts you or that you don't like, if you sulk around you can let sin pounce on you and you've got to master these these feelings. So this again, it, we can look at as this is about growing up. This is about growing mature. And Cain gets the opportunity before Abel does. Abel doesn't have to do, do any growing up. He just like he just acts himself and and everything is fine. Uh, Cain, it goes the complex route of his parents, which is he gets to learn more about as I grow and I experience life and there's parts about it I don't like, am I going to let those feelings overtake me so that I end up doing stupid things that make it worse? Or do I try to master or to kind of get over these feelings? So th this is something that we as humans we can we can identify with uh, still to this day, uh, and that is we go through life and things happen and they seem unfair and we don't like them, and uh, it, we complain about it and we can let those things get the best of us so that we end up making that situation worse, and. That is what happened to Cain. Um, verse eight, Cain, I'm sorry, verse nine. God said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, how should I know? Am I his babysitter? God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is calling to me from the ground. 
from now on, you'll get nothing but curses from this ground. You'll be driven from this ground that has opened its arms to receive the blood of your murdered brother. You'll farm this ground, but it will no longer give you its best. You'll be a homeless wanderer on earth. All right. It doesn't want to go to the next page for me. Come on now. Verse 13, Cain said to God, my punishment is too much. I can't take it. You've thrown me off the land and I can never again face you. I am a homeless wanderer on earth and whoever finds me will kill me. God said to him, no, anyone who kills Cain will pay for it seven times over. God put a mark on Cain to protect him so that no one who met him would kill him. Cain left the presence of God and lived in no man's land east of Eden. So here, just like Adam and Eve, Cain has his own, um, his own temptation, his own mishandling of the temptation, him having to face the consequences of his temptation, and, and still, just like with Adam and Eve, God doesn't just, just end his life or leave him. Uh, he, he still takes care of him. He makes sure that no one will kill him, even though he has to suffer the consequences of this decision that he has made. And um, so moving on to verse 17. Cain slept with his wife. She conceived and had Enoch. Enoch. Uh, he then built a city and named it after his son, Enoch. Enoch had Arad, uh, and, and then we have several other, other names here. Uh, Lamech married two wives, uh, and Ada gave birth to Jabal, the ancestors who all live in tents and herd cattle, and, and so on. So here, here moving on, we have mostly genealogy and then a little bit of kind of a word or phrase that describes what that person's life was like. And then in verse 25, Adam slept with his wife again. She had a son uh, and she named him Seth. She said, God has given me another child in place of Abel whom Cain killed. And then Seth had a son and named him Enosh. That's when men and women begin praying and worshiping in the name of God. So uh, this chapter kind of ends with uh, the birth of Seth. It is through Seth that we see kind of the more of the unfolding of, of God's chosen people. It's not going to be Cain. Abel is dead, so it's going to come through Seth. And then the the Old Testament will continue on in this regard, looking at specific people through whom the, the plans of God and the purposes of God are unfolded. It's, it's through people. And I'm going to read you another note here from, um, from Peterson. We're going to skip verse uh, chapter 5. It's, it's genealogy and people's ages. And so... We're going to skip through that, but I do want to read his note here. The history of salvation is thick with names. The genealogical lists in the Bible document the most exciting parts of the story. The gospel addresses not a faceless, nameless mob, but individual people. The story of salvation is thick with names. A name is the form of speech by which a person is singled out for personal love, particular intimacy, and exact responsibilities. The biblical fondness for genealogical lists isn't a pedantic antiqu antiquarianism. It's a search for personal involvement, a quest for a sense of personal place in the web of relationships in which God fashions salvation. So, uh, you know, oftentimes we look at these genealogical lists uh, that um, for a lot of people are very boring. I happen to like genealogy, but I don't do it all the time. Um, we want more story. We don't just want 
a list of names. But as Peterson points out, uh, this shows God is personally and particularly involved in individual lives. So this can be encouraging to us uh, to look at how is God working in my own life. All right, before moving on to Genesis 6, Jason says, interesting take on Cain and Abel. This makes Cain the father of the nomads. Yes, uh, if he is if he is the wanderer, the place that has no home, the, the place in the Middle East where people wander around, which the children of Israel did for 40 years, and which a lot of folks in that region did, um, that, that becomes their story. Uh, we, we see this later on with other, with other stories, with brothers and sisters, or with, uh, mostly with brothers, uh, like with, uh, like with uh, Ishmael and Isaac, we've got some kind of a falling out, and then one is kind of the chosen one that moves on in this story, and the other is the one that is kind of left. So just like Cain, Ishmael is kind of like swept to the side uh, and goes off and, and has a life separate from his family. And, um, but we still see statements within the scriptures that say God was still with them and God still took care of them. Um, later on, as we see the children of Israel go into the, the promised land, the land of Canaan, we see that there is kind of this uh, reconnection with the offspring of people that were from the black sheep of the family. And so that's, you know, I guess the, the land is only so big where you're going to end up coming into contact with your family members sooner or later. And uh, so aren't the name, aren't names the connectivity that is required by Jewish faith to designate what tribe to which one belongs? Yes. Yeah. So name, a name is not just like names are today. It, it, it seems to have a lot more weight uh, than uh, than before, and then of course we see with the with the all the brothers of Jacob's uh, from J- from Jacob, uh, all of his sons is where we're getting the those tribe names for Israel. So Genesis chapter six. Now this is if you haven't seen this before, this is a pretty interesting and and wacky little set of verses here and um but it's but it's in here in the bible let's read it genesis 6 starting in verse 1 when the human race began to increase with more and more daughters being born the sons of god noticed that the daughters of men were beautiful they looked them over and picked out wives for themselves then god said I'm not going to let I'm not going to breathe life into men and women endlessly. Eventually they're going to eventually they're going to die. From now on they can expect a lifespan of 120 years. This was back in the days and also later when there were giants in the land. The giants came from the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. These were the mighty men of ancient lore, the famous ones. This is a this is a story that's another another one that makes us scratch our heads. What is this all about? If you did see, I don't know if if anybody saw the uh, the movie Noah with um, the gladiator guy in it. Um, his name skips skips me right now. Um, it it goes into this a little bit. This uh, sons of God and daughters of Eve. I'm going to look at the the New Revised Standard Version here, and let's. It's just a few verses, so let's read from it and see if it sounds any different or the same. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they looked and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. 
Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. So th this is the, the, the Nephilim. Uh, Peterson's translation is uh, uh, the giants. And, and so th that's in the, the, the movie Noah, uh, and, it, and it looks at that. And this is, these were, Whoever these people were, were um, affected by the flood, and the 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 take on it is is pretty different for um, for the movie Noah. But I don't know that the, that his take on it is any less kind of wild than than just reading it straight from the from the text. So. I'm, I'm not going to really add any more than that uh, because I don't know everything. Anything that I add would kind of just be speculation. Um, these people, starting in the next few verses, we have the story of Noah and his sons, and we kind of have this restart to earth. So just like we had God preferring uh, one child over the other, um, for that child to carry out his purposes, this is what we see with Noah. Noah is a chosen person of God that carries out his purposes. And what ends up happening is that all the rest of human beings end up being on the outskirts, on the outside of the story. So they are, uh, they're gone after, after the story of the flood. We're at 1047, so we can, we can get a start in the story of Noah. It's a little bit longer than the stories that we've read so far, so we'll probably have to do at least a two-parter. But let's go ahead and get started. So Noah and his sons. God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation, make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes, and bugs, birds, and the works, I'm sorry I made them. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. This is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and saw how bad it was. Everyone corrupt and corrupting, life itself corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making a clean sweep. All right, so something that's different, Russell Crowe, that's correct, Russell Crowe. Um, he's, he's the one in this version of Noah. Anytime I bring movies up, I, I always wonder if I should make a disclaimer. I saw this movie, but it doesn't mean I recommend this movie. It is, it is a very different take. It's, very, it's a very dark and, uh, and gritty version of the story. That movie probably enjoys showing this part of the story, which is everybody, humanity out of control, just dark and violent and just evil, just nothing, nothing redeeming. Now, the fact that we have this story a few verses after the uh, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel story, we're going to go back to this idea of the sinful nature. The, the, the fact that we have this, now it is many, many generations later. Uh, if, if we looked back, we could see now. In, in this story, one thing that I didn't mention is that a generation for, uh, according to these uh, genealogies in Genesis 5, 
people were living un, until they're 800s and 900 years old. And they're having kids when they're like 100 years old. So that's, that's another... In anyway, there's a there's a there's a long period of time in between the the Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel story and the Noah story, but apparently through those centuries, things just kept getting worse and worse according to the story of Noah. So you can understand why, going back to our earlier discussion, you can understand if looking at this process, you can understand why people would say, "Aha! I told you." Evil is what's in the heart of people, and that's what ends up being the default. People always go and do the wrong thing. So um, look at the example of, of where they ended up with Noah. Uh, that You can make your case there. Now, another, another side note here. Getting into people living to be 800, 900 years old, this is a, there, there's several parts of the book of Genesis that seem to be at odds with our scientific, rational, modern way of viewing life. You know, we look back and we say, if we look scientifically at all the evidence that we have through human records uh, and, um, and things like that, nobody could, no humans can live that long. In fact, we've been going the other way. The human lifespan has actually been increasing because of nutrition, because of medical care. So the lifespan's going the other way. What do we do with this? Um, we can do it in several ways. We can say, well, the way that they were counting, you know, maybe one of their years was not the same as ours uh, for whatever reason. But anyway, I'm not going to stick around in that. Uh, in that story for for very long. This is along the lines of you know one of the one of the questions that pastors typically get. One of the one of the some of the harder questions somebody will ask: Where did Cain get his wife? It's not a it's not in the story. We don't know if it was one of his sisters. Uh, we don't know if there were other people living at that time, and it just didn't make it into the story. What we have to do with these stories is we have to ask ourselves, what is the heart in the story? What is really the deeper purpose that the story is trying to convey? And if we get into the details of, of, of it and trying to understand those details rationally instead of like, like metaphorically, spiritually, um, I, don't, I don't know that it really helps. I've seen it. I've seen many people try to do this where they, they try to give a rational sense of how this could be taken literal and, and things could, um, uh, those, those arguments always seem to fall apart uh, for me. This idea of the life, here we go, uh, verse 3, we have the lifespan of 120 years. Well, we're not there yet. <laughs> Or <laughs> maybe we were, and and then uh, and then the flood came, and then we, everything gets wiped out. So, back to Noah. Noah is uh, one of the interesting things about Noah is that it doesn't say uh, in the story of uh, God and Cain and Abel that that Cain or Abel did something good or bad. It doesn't say Cain was a bad person. And Abel was a good person, therefore God chose Abel because he was the good son, uh, and and he and he preferred that. It doesn't tell us that. It doesn't say that either one of them were good or bad. It just said God had a preference. In this story, we see God preferring or choosing Noah because he was a good man. Is what it is what it seems to be. And so this is a different type of a choosing. This is a choosing because of a person's character, not just because, hey, I, I, I like him more than, than the other ones. And, uh, and so we see that Noah becomes kind of the, the go-to person for making this clean sweep. And let's just go ahead and finish this out, this uh, 
uh, Genesis 6, we'll finish this out. Verse 14, build yourself a ship from teak wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. Make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Build a roof for it. Put in a window 18 inches from the top and put a door on, a door on the side of the ship. Make three decks, lower, middle, upper. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. Total destruction. But I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You'll board the ship and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives will come on board with you. You are also to take two of each living creature, a male and a female, on board the ship to preserve their lives with you. Two of every species of bird, mammal, and reptile, two of everything so as to preserve the lives along with yours. Their lives along with yours. Also, get all the food you'll need and store it up for you and them. Noah did everything God commanded him to do. So, pretty specific directions. Why uh, does um, why is it important for for it to remain in the Holy Scriptures that the roof that goes on the ark must have a window 18 inches from the top? I, I, it's a good question. I don't know that there's a deep metaphorical spiritual um, <laughs> reason for that. Um, I don't know if these measurements were later on used in some fashion. I know that I, I, I think here in the U.S. somebody has made a replica of the ark that fits these specific uh, directions. And uh, the ability to fit two of every single kind of animal in there, this is where the rational mind comes in and says, um, I don't think they could fit two of every single living thing that ever existed. And then you get into the tricky part of, all right, does that mean two mosquitoes? And does that mean two butterflies? And, uh, you know, here's, here's where it gets, it gets tricky. Again, overthinking the rational aspect of it, it can be a fun game, we can, you know, you can take it and, tr and try to figure it out. I haven't, I haven't found that, that journey of figuring out what's in the scripture rationally to really benefit <clears throat> the, uh, and enhance my relationship with God. Uh, just knowing each and every detail, it's, uh, it's almost like, if we need to understand, if we need to know and understand every single rational detail in this book in order to trust it, then we're probably not going to end up very happy because there's going to be something in here that is not rational for, for one person or the other uh, or it seemed contradictory. Again, my, my suggestion is go to the heart of what is this story about. This is a story about when things go wrong, God provides a way out. Now, this can be in our neighborhood, in our country, in the world. When things start to go real bad, God is going to be there to guide us using us to move into the future. God will provide salvation for us and God will provide a good life for us. So we get a sense of God's justice. God doesn't want bad stuff to be happening to people too much. God steps in and, and, and tries to reset us. God provides some kind of a route for us to... to to end up staying connected with him and living a good life. That's really what I see. Uh, that's what I see in this story. And if I get caught up in the details of it, um, it's not really going to necessarily enhance. It doesn't, you know, f for me to say these literal 
these things literally happen exactly this way. I don't have to accept that in order for me to benefit in my relationship with God from what this story is trying to tell us about God. Now, I don't go so far as to say nothing in the Bible ever happened because, I mean, something happened because it, it became a story that we passed down uh, generation after generation. Needed a, play, a place to launch the dove. That's what the window was for. Was Noah vegetarian or did he take more than two animals each? I don't. Noah, do you? Ha 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 ha. So yes. Now, why? Yes, I understand that it the that it we do need a window for the dove. Eighteen inches from the top. I I don't I I'm not sure what's magical about that. I guess he's gonna need if 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 the uh, if the boat's forty five feet high got three decks I guess each deck is probably about 15 feet each so you've let's let's say for argument's sake the third deck is 15 feet from the ceiling and probably he's gonna have to build a ladder unless maybe the third deck was was a little higher maybe it only had like a six foot ceiling so that that 18 inches would have been just right for Noah to launch that dove out of the window so see how, you know, you, we can go down that crazy road. <laughs> it's fun and, and, and interesting, but I don't know that it uh, completely enhances our relationship. And see, the other thing it does is it makes you go over time when you get into those details. So thank you so much for joining in today. We will pick up where we left off and we'll look at this, the next chapter in Genesis when we come back together. <clears throat> Send us out in the power of your Spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. May each thought and word bring glory to your name. Send us out in your Spirit, Lord, we pray. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. so much for joining in. It was very good speaking with everybody today. Um, thank you everybody for joining and Jason. Have a great afternoon. Look forward to seeing you guys again very soon. Take care.